Hey guys, welcome back to Keys to the Cosmos. This is Astrophotography Target Tips number 14. I don't know about you, but when I first learned about astrophotography and I was sort of following guys on Instagram and Google searching targets and all that, there was a couple select targets that I remember thinking to myself, wow. First of all, I couldn't believe they were real. And second of all, that people were imaging it. And third, um, that it was something that we could actually capture from a backyard and that I could do myself. And one of those comes to mind for sure. The first one was Ro Ofuyuki. Now I did image that um, early this year in the spring. And um, that was a real amazing target to be able to finally image. And second of all, that comes to mind, I remember the first time I saw the Helix Nebula. I thought to myself, wow. That is, first of all, unbelievably beautiful. But I thought, man, that is one target I need to be able to image one day. And I missed out on last year. But this year, I said, I'm going to wait for it the right time of year. And I'm going to give it my best to image it. And I was able to do it. And I'm so happy that it's done. There's a similarity between Ro Fuki and um, the Helix Nebula. Both are southern sky uh, targets. And both stay very low in that sky. Now the southern sky for me here in Boreal 9 Toronto is pretty bad. It's washed out. You don't see a lot of stars and if it stays, if a target stays very low that creates a real challenge. You're shooting in the worst part of the sky and whenever it's low you generally get obstacles, right? You get trees, houses, roofs, whatever it is. So you generally speaking will have a very limited um, opportunity to image. So Ro Fuki was challenging and it was challenging for another reason, and that is um, that it's a multiple target image. So in other words, it has a star cluster in it, it has a mission nebula, and it has a reflection nebula. Now that's a challenge because as I mentioned in my video on that target, you can't shoot it all with a narrow band light pollution filter like the L Extreme. So that means that basically it's impossible to shoot from where I'm located. I need to be able to use a narrowband filter to block out all that sky glow. So I had to go to a different site to image it. The good thing is with the Helix Nebula, it's a planetary nebula and you can shoot it with a narrowband filter. So that was a saving grace. It actually goes a little higher as well than Rolf Fiuki. So it's not high by any means. I think it gets to 27 degrees here in Toronto. We're at 43 degrees latitude. So. Uh, definitely still very low. I generally don't even start shooting most images till about 25, 30 degrees. So that just goes to show it can be a real challenge. So to be able to finally have this image done, I'm really excited and I'm so happy I was able to get it. So let's talk about everything we need to know about the Helix Nebula, how to capture the data on it, and of course, how to process it. So the Helix Nebula, very briefly, is a planetary nebula, as I mentioned. It's basically a star that exploded. It shedded its outer layers and they created this beautiful eye-shaped target. In fact, the helix is also known as the eye of God. So it's this big, beautiful, bright uh, planetary nebula that looks, like it's, that looks like it's looking back at you. Such a unique target and that's why it was one that I had to I definitely put on my must image list. Now a couple um, challenges which brings us into our first a portion of the video which is location. Now I can't speak for everyone but I can tell you in my southern skies here in Toronto there are very few stars that are visible and that makes finding a target like this really challenging. I normally try to give you guys some nearby stars that you can sort of star hop that you can use as a reference and that will make finding a small target like this a lot easier but in this one what can I say there's not much I can tell you. The best thing I had as a reference was the planet Jupiter. Jupiter. So the good thing is Jupiter is easy to find. You don't need to look for it. It's the brightest thing in the southern sky. And this time of year, it's out every night alongside Saturn. So that was the good part. Now the bad part is there's nothing else in my particular sky. So here's an image here to give you an example of how I found it. You see Jupiter at the top there. And basically what I did was Jupiter from Jupiter to go down and to the left and it's sort of like I pictured like an L in the sky. The problem is, how do you know how far down to go? And how do you know how far over left to go? You don't. At least I couldn't. I had to sort of guess. The first night in finding this target, it took me 45 minutes or so. 
I was so happy to find it in that first test exposure that it finally popped on the screen. I was so excited, and man, I was, I knew it would be a challenge. I figured somewhere around an hour, so to be able to do it in 45 minutes, I was actually quite happy. But I just wanna warn you guys, it's going to be a challenge if you're in really light polluted skies and if your southern skies look like mine. Now, there is another star below it that you can use as a reference, and it's much closer than Jupiter. The problem is it doesn't rise high enough, at least in my skies, until it's, you're already, basically by the time it rises high enough to see, you're already cutting into your imaging time. And as I mentioned with this particular target, you probably will have a very limited window. It has a very shallow arc, okay? So it comes up, it hits about 20 degrees, which in my opinion is the lowest you'd want to start, 15 to 20 degrees at the lowest. Comes up, hits about 27 degrees, and starts dipping right away. So for me, it was about a two and a half hour window, give or take. So if I were to wait for that lower starter to rise high enough to see, which is, and then it is closer to, to um, the helix, so it's a much better reference than Jupiter is, I would have already cut about half an hour into my imaging time. So I didn't want to do that. So I basically just moved my telescope in the area I thought it was and just started taking 30 second exposures. And what I will, what I can tell you is it's low, probably lower than you think and farther to the left than you think. But one tip I will give you, when you do find it eventually that first night, make sure you make a mental note. Use something like a laser pointer and use something uh, on the horizon to mark it. For me, it was a particular tree, okay, that I knew I could find each time. It was a, a fairly big, low tree. And basically, the Helix Nebula at around, I can't remember, 10.30 or so, 10.30 or 11, came up right above that. So I knew that's where I could find the Helix Nebula. So the next night I went out to find it, I was able to find it, I think, on the second try. So it was because I marked it in my head, I made a mental note of where it was, I was able to find it. So the first night might be frustrating, but if you're doing multi-night imaging, which you probably will on a target like this, make sure you mark it and that uh, will help make it a lot easier the next night or two. So that's the best I can tell you with location, guys. It's a tricky one, but give yourself time and you will eventually find it. Now let's talk about, um, we'll go right into integration time. When it comes to framing it up, let's be honest, it's a small target. Just try to get it as close to center as possible. But for integration time, I got six and a half hours on this particular target. Now, I did that over three nights because as I mentioned, I'm very limited in my window. The third night it fogged over, so that, that really limited it. Most likely you're not gonna wanna shoot this with a full moon. Generally speaking, the moon comes up in the southeastern sky. Uh, in fact, right now it's right beside Jupiter. So that would not have been, this would not be a good time to image that. Um, it's already challenging enough being as low as it is don't bother with the moon right there. I think it's just going to make it too much too much of a challenge. So um, I had three nights that I was able to get a total of six and a half hours. Now you can shoot this target if you have decent skies for even an hour and you'll be able to see it. You're not going to get great colors. You're not going to get great detail, but it'll be there and you can say I image the helix. If you want to do it justice, in my opinion, you need to spend at least three hours in light polluted skies. You got to remember, I'm using, as always, a smaller telescope, right? So we're doing a pretty significant crop and in order to do it justice there's nothing better than just sinking integration time into it so at least three hours if you can do closer to what I did six and a half great if you can do even more maybe you can shoot over four or five nights you get a nice stretch of clear skies with that moon gone go for it the more you sink into it the more you'll be able to crop it and not lose detail and uh, sort of help get rid of that noise from the light pollution around it uh, here's a single exposure. You can see it's very bright. Okay, this is 60 seconds as always. It's very bright and that's why I'm saying when you do find it, you'll know. It'll pop up very clearly on your screen. Um, but you can see it's quite small. And I ended up doing quite a big crop. I didn't plan on it, but I, what can I say? I'm just a sucker for the detail in these beautiful nebula. So I ended up doing a pretty extreme crop. So I'm glad I was able to get at least six hours to help do that. Now let's talk about um, processing. Here's my stacked image, okay? Pretty typical, very dark, just a couple stars showing. Um, when it comes to processing, I had to do a lot of stretching to, re to make this one pop out. Stretching, levels adjustment, back and forth, as always we talk about in all these videos. And then along the way, as it starts to go wonky colors while you stretch, using that sampler and the levels adjustment to uh, fix that, uh, 
usually yellowy green color that starts to show up and get it back to its regular colors, its natural colors, and you should see the nebula pop even more after you do that. So once I had stretched it to the point where it was starting to blow out in certain sections, I, of course I stopped. Um, then I started doing more fine adjustments. So I lassoed off the entire uh, Helix Nebula and I started doing my adjustments on the entire thing. Camera Raw Filter, Texture tab, Clarity tab, Highlights, Contrast, all the usuals, just to sort of bring out as much color as possible and to bring out as much detail as possible. After I did that, I switched to the inverse. So select at the top, click on inverse, and now we're working on the background. I did a gradient exterminator um, just to sort of even out the background, that sky, a little bit of sky glow that I still got, even though the filter it filtered out most of it. And then just sort of working with the exposure tab in the camera raw filter, the blocks level, um, luminance level, just to get it nice and smooth and to get it fairly consistently black. I did such a big crop that there's really not a lot of background to worry about, but nonetheless, I still did all that. Now, once I had fixed that properly and I was, it looked natural, right? We always talk about feathering those adjustments, that little box at the top, you wanna to feather it so that doesn't look unnatural. Once I was happy with the way that looked, then I started lassoing off key parts of the image and I actually lassoed off five key parts, okay? So first of all, I started with what we'll call the pupil, the center part of the helix, that sort of beautiful bluey green circle where the first exploded out from that star. And I just went, Primarily I went to the color balance and I sort of lowered it towards the blue just to sort of bring it out a little bit more. It was a bit pale looking. And that just sort of made it a more blue. You can even adjust the green and that made it a more bluey green color and I was happy with that. Then I lassoed off the middle part, I guess you would call it the iris of the helix eye and played with that part. Um, sort of cooled it down so that it looked more almost whitish um, and just played with it until I was happy with it. I wanted contrast between the pupil, the iris, and the outer uh, section of the eye. So that's what I played with till I was happy with that. And then I lassoed off the outer part of the eye. And I played with that. That's sort of a reddish orange, depending on um, the warmth level that you wanna have. For me, I preferred more of a cool, um, sort of an orangey red, uh, a whitish iris, and then a bluey green um, pupil. So that was the look that I was going for. Some guys go for more of a not so cool, a warmer image. So we're bringing that warmth uh, tab all the way more towards the right. And when you do that, you get more of an orange, uh, white and green um, uh, pupil. So it depends what you like. Uh, it depends on your, as, as always with processing, it depends on what looks right to you. So that's what I did. I played with, I lassoed off all three aspects of the eye and played with them individually. And then as well, if you think of the eye, sort of the corners of your eye, think of that in the image, they were a little bit faint. So I even lassoed off the two um, corners of the image, the corners of the eye, if you will, and just sort of uh, increase exposure a little bit, increase highlights, just to sort of make them appear even more. And so now it looked like a really distinct eye in the sky. That even rhymes, so that works out well. So that's what I did. And then basically after I was happy with everything, I could see some detail. I just sort of made fine adjustments once again to the entire thing. The whole, the whole goal for me in this was, you know, I'm, I'm trying to remember that I'm shooting with a small refractor. You know, I'm looking at images online of guys shooting with big telescopes, 9.25 edge HDs. And, you know, we just can't replicate that with a small refractor. Um, at least without sinking 20 plus hours in. So I'm trying, I was trying to be realistic, but I wanted to really get some depth in the picture, right? So this is a star, as you mentioned, it ejected its outer layers. Some are farther out, some are closer in. I wanted to get depth in my image. And I think I was able to accomplish that to some extent. So that was my goal in making those fine adjustments, playing with the texture, uh, the clarity tabs. I wanted to sort of bring out, and contrast of course as well, to bring out those, uh, that depth in the image and to make it look sort of 3D. And I think, as I mentioned, I accomplished that to, to some extent anyway. But I'll, I'll probably reprocess, reprocess this one a couple times and maybe I'll even be able to improve on it. But those are really my key tips. Other than that, it's basically a standard emission type uh, target where you know the key is to bring it out first 
and then work on that background, get that looking nice, and then just work on the details. But I took some time with this one. This was probably on the longer side for processing, and I tried a couple different techniques, but those are sort of the main things. Take your time, and if you really want to get detail, lasso off key sections of the of the helix and try to get those colors like you want them. It, it's not that it didn't look good after doing the initial processing, but um, I just the colors to me weren't vivid enough and I wanted to improve that. So that's why I um, lassoed off all those key areas. One last thing I should mention, I ended up doing the star, starless. I just sort of had this image in my head of this um, big bright eye amidst, amidst sort of a plain black background. And so that's the look I went for. So after I did my initial processing, I put in the star net plus plus, like so many of my other images, removed the stars, and then did a little bit uh, final touch-ups in um, in my uh, in processing software. I use a couple of different ones. Um, I, as I've mentioned in some of my other videos, I generally at the very end when I go to post on Instagram, I'll flip it to my phone and I'll use Photoshop Express. And so that's where I did my final adjustments to it and that's where I was really able to pop the colors before I uh, posted it, or before I, I will be posting on Instagram shortly anyway. So uh, that's basically what I did. Once I, once I removed the stars, I just made some fine adjustments in Photoshop and then on my phone on Photoshop Express, which I do with all my images. It just sort of makes them um, look right on a mobile device with a backlit screen and then I'm, it's ready to post Instagram, Twitter, whatever it is that you want to share it with. So yeah, other, other than that, um, it was pretty standard processing. And I really did love this one. I was so happy to get it off my list. And I, and I was able to get it this year. I missed it last year. But one thing I will promise you is that we'll be imaging this one again next year. Definitely with a bigger telescope. And I'm going to try and improve it quite a bit. But for now... This is the image I have. I hope you guys enjoy it. And I hope that you guys get an opportunity to go out and try to image and process this beautiful target as well. If you've got a little bit of uh, experience behind you and you're fairly good at finding things in the night sky, I say go for it. Sink as much time as you can, but make sure you look at where the moon is and make sure you go ahead of time and look at your southern skies and make sure that it's fairly clear. You, we have a small window left to do this one. Get out there and image it, guys, and I look forward to seeing them on Instagram and other social media platforms. Thanks so much. I really appreciate your support, as always, and I will see you on the next one. Take care.